Of course, with the emergence and global spread of COVID-19, universities have shifted focus. During the next session, our panelists are going to discuss the Coursera for Campus Coronavirus Response Initiative and how universities around the world are rethinking, retooling, and rewriting the rules of engagement for teaching and learning. So Jeff talked about what Coursera has, now universities are going to talk about how they're using it. They'll give us a glimpse into the future of rapid digital transformation. Coursera's Chief Enterprise Officer, Leah Belsky, will moderate our panel. Leah? Thank you, Betty. As Jeff mentioned, over a month ago, Coursera launched the Coursera for Campus Coronavirus Initiative. And the response from universities has truly been astounding. It's really, it's unlike anything I've seen in my lifetime or career, for sure. We're also seeing that the initiative is bringing together university leaders, governments, global institutions like the World Bank and UNESCO, and are coming together to share best practices and really rethink how universities can, can prepare for the future. So I'm excited now to invite three university leaders who are part of the Coursera community to share their experiences thus far. But before I do, I'd like to welcome Shwetab Matal to the virtual stage. Shwetab is the head of enterprise product at Coursera, and he's going to introduce you to Coursera's coronavirus <coughs> initiative in a little bit more depth. Thanks, Shwetab, and welcome. Thank you, Leah, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining our virtual conference from all different parts of the globe. As Leah mentioned, I'm Shwetab Mittal. I lead uh, the product management team leading enterprise and our Coursera for Campus product. I'm going to take a few minutes to describe our coronavirus response initiative and the way universities around the globe have been using this initiative to engage with students while on-campus activity has been interrupted. In early March, we announced the coronavirus response initiative where Coursera began offering free access to its course, course catalog to any college or university impacted by COVID-19. And over the past few weeks, we've seen thousands of universities around the globe looking for this platform to be able to engage with their students. We've launched more than 2,600 universities around the globe that have invited around 800,000 students. How can people with almost uh, apply? 400,000 students that have been joined and over 1.3 million hours of learning. And this number of hours of learning has been growing pretty rapidly over the last few days. And so students have been voracious learners while on-campus activities have been interrupted. They have been learning on Coursera platform pretty rapidly. We see hundreds of hours of learning being added every day by students on our platform. To put our initiative in context, today almost 1.6 billion students across the globe have been impacted due to coronavirus. And we believe that with our coronavirus response initiative, we have been able to only reach a fraction of these universities and these students. And we really hope that over the next few weeks and months, we can provide this platform to a lot more universities so that they can take advantage and provide quality learning to their students while on-campus activities have been impacted. As we launch more universities on our platform, we've been asking them really to understand what use cases are they using Coursera for campus uh, for their students. First of all, we're hearing that they're using uh, our courses to supplement papers, lectures, and existing subjects. Second, they're offering electives, in some cases, honors degrees or Coursera courses for credit. Third, in a lot of cases, they are, the universities are helping students develop the skills in emerging areas so that the students can be job ready as soon as they graduate. And last but not the least, there is a lot of cross-functional skills that are being taught. So for example, law students learning CS or art students learning data science. Let me describe two specific case studies. The first one is NMIMS, which is a university based out of India. And they have launched Coursera for Campus for their engineering, MBA, and pharma students across five campuses. And they're really using Coursera for Campus in a unique way that students can earn up to, who earn up to 20 credits, which is equivalent to 300 hours of learning on Coursera, can earn an honors degree as long as they maintain a 3.0 GPA. 
and students can take anywhere from two to four years while they're uh, enrolled in the degree to earn these credits and earn an honor degree. Second example is Universidad Nacional de Colombia, it's a university uh, based out of Colombia, and they were they had to move online in response to the coronavirus epidemic, and there the students there have been picking up Coursera really as a way to build the skills so that they can be prepared for jobs one day once they graduate. So with that, I'm going to hand it off back to Leah to kick off the panel. Great, thanks very much, Fatab. Now I'd like to introduce you to our three panelists. We're joined here by Professor Simona Baltendag. Professor Baltendag is the Vice President of Education at Imperial College London, and she's also been a member of the Coursera Advisory Board. We're also joined by Matthew Raskoff. Matthew is the Associate Vice Provost for Digital Education and Innovation at Duke University. And lastly, we're joined by Dr. Rupa Manjari Ghosh, Dr. Ghosh is currently the Vice Chancellor of Shiv Nadar University in India. Thank you, all of you, for joining us. We really appreciate it. So to kick us off, I'd like to ask a somewhat simple question, and that is, how has each of your universities responded to the coronavirus thus far? And what has really been the response from students and faculty during this time? Matthew, do you want to kick us off? Thank you, Leah, and thank you all for including me in this virtual conference. One observation that I make is that there are far more people participating in the virtual conference than I've ever seen at one of the face-to-face -face conferences that Coursera has done. So we're kind of demonstrating in real time the potential of a digital transformation of something that we miss and I hope we go back to, but still has potential in its own right. Very true. So my experience comes from working on two institutions' crisis responses. Um, one is Duke Kunshan University and one is Duke University. Duke Kunshan University is a sister institution of Duke where I work, located about an hour outside of Shanghai. And it's a joint venture between Wuhan University and Duke University in China. Um, given its location, Duke Kunshan gave us a kind of early drill in this crisis response and went through an emergency remote teaching transition in February, about a month before Duke and other American institutions did. That's when we first approached Coursera about setting up Coursera for campus there. And that kind of framed our thinking about how there are really kind of two phases of this work. And I think two use cases that correspond to each of those phases. Phase one, we can think of as the emergency remote teaching phase. We're calling it a kind of first aid for education. Can we stop the bleeding? Can we keep things going? Can we take a semester that's been interrupted to the very end? What do we need to, just to finish the semester? And that's been very Zoom dependent, as Jeff said, with all of the kind of concurrent fat challenges of Zoom fatigue. Phase two, though, I think is going to be more of that um, opportunity um, that we heard Daphne talking about of new online and hybrid models, probably starting for us um, in the fall. At Duke Kunshan, we saw it in their fourth session because they have seven week kind of mini masters there. And I think the challenge in that mode is going to be how do we preserve what is good from this moment and how do we take courses that are going to be brand new um, and figure out how to deliver them online at scale as expectations of quality from our students go up and their expectations of value also go up. So those, that's kind of how we're framing the challenge and our response. And I can talk a little bit more later, I hope, about you know, what we see is necessary in each of those phases. Great, thanks so much, Matthew. Um, Dr. Ghosh, do you wanna jump in next? I know India headed into shutdown much later than many of us, and so I'm curious to hear your experiences thus far. Yes, uh, thank you very much. You know, thank you for uh, bringing all of us together on this virtual platform. The world uh, around us is changing in a fundamental way. And uh, the new normal, you know, we are all talking about that and I'm, it's, it uh, has to be fine. Nobody really knows what it is going to be. So let me briefly share our experience and I'll come back if more uh, points are, are raised. So uh, first, my university is a very small scale but deep intervention, uh, about 2000 plus students, 200 faculty members. And it is uh, only eight and a half years old. 
is founded in 2011 by the Shiv Nader Foundation. So the, the mission of uh, the foundation was uh, nation building through transformational education. And you know, that's one mission that cannot stop. You know, no disruption of whatever magnitude cannot really stop this. So uh, our system uh, has been, our young system has been quite agile. And when the current problems started staring at our face, and uh, this was March for us, you know, we had the time to watch the world and kind of uh, prepared, but we took an early decision to uh, move all possible classes online. Now, this has been an ad hoc solution and mostly live sessions and definitely not perfect. And uh, when I was worried that uh, how this was always in our planning, but when this had to be done almost overnight, uh, I thought my faculty members would be all uh, very uh, tired and, uh, but you know, the strangely, I think our faculty members are all enjoying the new format. And I am seeing fatigue from our students. You know, it's essentially you have got your online class is essentially your physical class is live sessions through this medium. And we're still going from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. or even more. And uh, the fatigue is showing up in our students. So we have been serving them pretty regularly to figure out what to emphasize on. And one mantra has come out, of course, that you have to go much slower. You cannot really, most faculty members thought they could deliver more efficiently in a blended way, uh, somewhat synchronous as well as asynchronous ways. But, uh, you know, you have to really slow it down. So uh, I think one thing for sure is that everybody is very accommodating right now because it's a crisis and it's a response to that, the banded theory. <laughs> yeah, I liked it. So, so everybody is accommodating. So campuses are closed. Learning has been continuing. Has it been perfect? No. But we are not actually moving to even a grading system that is passed fail. We are now working on assessment schemes to make sure that it's discriminatory enough for us to be able to award letter grades. And mostly concerned with the final year batches, uh, both, uh, you know, PhD, of course, uh, defenses are happening online. That's not such a big problem. Uh, but uh, for undergraduate students, we are now trying to work on the assessment. And uh, this has been uh, really an accelerated path towards what we always wanted to do. Great. Thank you, Rupa Mandri. Um, Simona, what has been your experiences thus far? Yeah, like, like Matthew, I'd like to emphasize the difference between going into emergency online teaching and basically trying to do what we've been doing on campus uh, to make sure students are still getting taught and actually getting assessed. So at Imperial right now, we're teaching everything online and we'll be moving into online assessments as well. Uh, but a lot of that is clearly not what our students came to campus for and it's not at the quality uh, that we would like it to be, but it's great we can do it. Um, and where we've been very engaged with Coursera and have already used Coursera for campus, we, we see that that swift adaptation is going better. So for instance, our medical school, um, we've been working with Coursera for campus to completely revamp our MBBS. And it's been amazing how much that sort of digital mindset has helped teachers and students adapt more clearly to the emergency online delivery. So I think we were globally first um, in offering and, and actually executing our final medical school exams fully online. Our students were quite nervous, the teachers were, but it went absolutely beautifully and the students were actually really excited about it. We switched from um, multiple choice questions, which of course are easier to cheat on to more open-ended questions, students could use their books, but they had to pretty much know what they had to answer to do it well. And we did learning analytics and analyses on it, and it feels like it's a really robust exam. And our students were actually really happy. And the other good example, I think, is stemming from our global master in public health that Professor Helen Ward was talking about in one of the video clips earlier. And that's the, the course around COVID, Science Matters, that's on 100,000 learners. And there's no way we could have done something like that, in spite of the fact that Imperial College is kind of the center, if you wish, of the epidemiology and public health around COVID, if it hadn't been for the fact that we have the online um, global master degree. But later on, I'd, I'd like to talk about the world sort of after this emergency session and, and where we want to go 
with online, with Coursera, with global collaboration, making use of this crisis and, and maybe ramping things up that had already started. But this is my, my first impression of what's happening right now. We're, we're grateful for all the support that we've received in the past and all the activities um, by Coursera and with Coursera. Absolutely, thank you, Simona. Um, so Dr. Ghosh, when we got together um, before this panel to share experiences, you were talking about the challenges with some of your graduating students. They're graduating this year and some of their jobs are being disrupted, their internships are on hold. How are you thinking about supporting those graduating students um, during this period? Yes, uh, very, uh, very right. You know, this, uh, even in the, your previous question, I was talking about mostly the graduating students. Uh, it's been a very negative large scale disruption. Of course, academic sessions are delayed, you know, next session can be delayed, but you know, learning is not stopping. Placements are deferred, though not canceled. You know, big companies are just deferring. They're not canceling the offers they have already made. But we are also hearing from our alumni that secured jobs are disappearing. But you know, as they say, never miss a good crisis, right? So uh, let's, <laughs> let's look at the good news. It's really an ideal time to go back to the university and update our knowledge and skills. And that's the message I have for my students and my alumni, and to some extent my faculty and staff. And I must uh, thank Coursera for making all these courses available. You know, we already had a partnership with you starting last year, but at this time, uh, the, uh, because we are so small scale, as I mentioned, I could actually give Coursera licenses for free to all my faculty, staff, and students. And, but that's mostly for self-learning and I'm going to come back to what our partnership, the pilot project was all about in what extent this has been affected right now. But uh, for our, uh, you know, for our final year students and our alumni who are already in the market, we feel that this is the time that they should update their knowledge and skills. We already had that plan. We have the full school that's dedicated to what I call lifelong learning. So today the students cannot really graduate of campuses, they need to continuously update their skills to talk, you know, the new job opportunities that are coming out, otherwise you'll be completely being, missing them. So this has forced us to take some concrete steps and we are now rolling out business analytics kind of courses which are in demand and maybe short term certificate courses. We already run such certificate courses on say what is science and policy. And uh, we are planning to use your course in a platform to, uh, to produce some of these courses with our own faculty. Because, you know, we claim to be what I call a global university. While we are global in our outlook, but we are deeply rooted in our context. And I think uh, that's very important for all of you teachers. You know that you need to know your student to be able to uh, do this individualized teaching learning that everybody is talking about. And I think that makes it very imp important for us that we get into this business of producing online things. And I, we could not, cannot think of a better platform than Coursera. And so the next uh, thing that we are talking to your India office actually, is how to make these courses using your platform and your kind of uh, expertise to deliver what our people need given our context. Thanks, Dr. Ghosh. Um, so Matthew, when we first released Coursera for campus, there was, a big response, I would say, across the university ecosystem that no university is really going to bring another university's courses onto their campus. And we've, we've just heard from Dr. Ghosh that in this moment, it's useful, but in the future, the Eric School would like to go back to producing their own courses. Do you think we're going to see a shift in the way universities collaborate or use courseware from other universities once we get through this COVID period? I do think so, Leah. I think that is underway. That is what's happening i think in this phase too when we realize that we actually need access to what might be called courseware meaning modular content that we can use to kickstart course design and development and in fact we should use it because the faculty's role i think is moving up the value chain to adding more high engagement activities such as running discussions or doing custom assessments to the point about the medical students and moving more towards an open-ended assessment and curating high quality content that's created by other institutions. To me, that is one of these 
longer range, longer term impacts that we are likely to see. And it's going to flow directly from the fact that we now have to triage our courses and we simply cannot design 6,000 original courses that are listed in our catalog between now and September when our next semester starts. So assuming this next semester has to be remote, we are going to need to have a mechanism of triage and some number of those courses will design originally here, you know, as many as we can, but it's going to be a pretty small fraction. And for the rest of them, I do think we're going to need more courseware solutions at Duke and elsewhere. And, and I think that's probably a good thing for the long term because it can focus the faculty on those higher value, higher engagement activities, which is where the real learning happens. It's when students start to make sense of the content. It's not just about the delivery. It's when the social learning happens. It's when students can construct knowledge that those are the parts that you want to have a faculty member guiding our students through. So yes, I think that's underway right now. It's part of our planning for sure. And I think that is gonna be one of the long-term benefits that, that we can look for. Great, thanks. I'm just turning off my video for a moment because the internet connection is shaky. So Simona, let's re return to you. Um, your university, I think, has really been a leader in driving international collaborations, and you're leading one of the, the leading medical schools in the world, the leading public health institutions. How is this crisis shaping your vision of how the university might collaborate and teach moving forward? Yeah, thank you for asking that. I think, if anything, it's speeding up the vision that we already started developing. And actually, in the summer of 2019, so that was long before anybody ever heard of a new virus, um, let alone if it had been named. Um, we started talking um, about global collaboration and co-creation of, of online um, courses. And, and basically what we started with was thinking about what the world needs and looking at all the enormous global challenges like poverty and inequality and lack of education and clearly public health crises. Um, and we, we thought about the enormous potential that universities have to change the world. But the fact that because they're so located in a particular place and students still have to travel far from other continents to come to the top universities, the, the scale and maybe even the quality wasn't quite enough. And we started thinking about the potential of using the platforms like Coursera and others that clearly have grown enormously in capacity and quality and global reach to think about the, the mission of universities, namely to change the world and how to do that at scale and quality. And we started working on a model, which I think is absolutely um, still vital today and needs to be speeded up in which we were thinking about partnering um, between global north and global south universities so rich western universities and universities in low and middle income countries that have far less potential to teach far less potential to research and co-creating teaching so we were we were going to pilot we actually started but then sort of got stopped in our tracks because of covid and we were supposed to present at the live in-person Coursera conference, some of the pilots. So we started working with partner universities that Imperial has, for instance, in Ethiopia and Indonesia. And what we, what we were doing, what we've started doing is sending them our modules from the Global Master in Public Health. But of course, this model can apply in any particular um, program. And we were asking them to use those modules, for instance, about infectious disease epidemiology, and basically make them um, uh, more relevant to their local content. So maybe change some of the videos, some of the, the assessments, the coursework, other things to make it relevant to, in this case, Addis Ababa or, or Java in Indonesia, but then not stop there, but send us back the changed module. So we would then use the locally uh, important content in a different continent for our own students in London and truly create global communities of learners. So reverse innovation, not just thinking about our own research, but also picking up innovation from, from other continents and especially from low and middle income countries. And of course, we all know that the global challenges hit low and middle income countries much harder, pretty much any global challenge, including the COVID-19 crisis. And it's, it's extremely important that the local expertise, the local knowledge, local needs get met when we start working together 
in an online space. And because of the online space and the, the reach, the quality, the, the, the enormous innovative power now of artificial and virtual re, uh, reality uh, opportunities, you can do things that you couldn't even do in, an, in a regular classroom environment. And of course now, because of the lack of mobility and the, having to protect people from the actual virus, online becomes even more important. But the model was already, I think, quite disruptive in a really good way before COVID hit. So creating global communities of learners, but also global communities of researchers, if master students would start doing their thesis work in their own country, um, and then share that with students in other countries, have projects that they can do together on one particular topic. So then you also create communities of real-time knowledge sharing and communities that can continue long after the students have have gotten their degrees. And of course, you can also include people who are already in jobs or working in the front line of many of the, the issues that you're teaching about. And I think what that model really is needed if we're thinking of all the learners that right now don't get education. And of course, Jeff and Daphne spoke about, about that quite eloquently. And in terms of, yeah, never waste a good crisis. Um, I think we, we need this. We need to be more empathic. We need to think really about the the world and global networks of universities, but start working with universities in on continents, in countries where the needs are highest and make sure that we actually do it together. And um, I see enormous possibilities in the COVID-19 crisis to speed that up and also to make it more important. And as Dr. Gosch was saying, she's telling her students, this is the time where you actually need to get an education. And I think this is a time where lots and lots of intelligent young people who normally wouldn't be able to get an education need to get it through uh, platforms like Coursera and specifically through the collaborative efforts of universities across the globe. And it means a different hierarchy, different way of looking at the rankings. We need to move away from being very competitive still between each other and thinking about our status in global rankings and who's the most important and highly ranked that needs to go but Great. i think it, it was time that that was going to go anyway thanks very much um so in that direction and potentially a bit more controversial so we're now seeing articles every day about universities forecasting deficits students not returning to school do you all think that students will return to school and pay the same prices that they were paying for virtual education? Or do you think we're going to have to really rethink the university business model? And if we could answer sort of your, your quick answer in one minute each, and then we have a, a lot of questions from the audience as well. Shall I go first? Sure. Um, I, I think students are not, they're not going to be the same. And I don't think that students will want to pay the full price for online courses. But I think we need to think of students differently and we'll see much more online um, delivery, but also blended classrooms where we see lifelong learners and people who want an online degree because they have a job. They can't come to London for a whole year. But the traditional young people who come to campuses, I don't think they're going to be that interested in online degrees. They may have to because of you know, pandemics such as COVID. But I think they'll want different things and they, I think they're not going to be as happy with that offering as students who actually are really coming to uh, universities for online and part-time degrees. Awesome. Matthew, what do you think? Um, we just at noon Eastern today announced new lower tuition for our summer wow. courses. Um, our summer session was always lower tuition than our fall spring semesters, but this is significant, and I do think it recognizes that new focus on value and value for money um, that I think is perfectly reasonable. And I do think if this persists for the long term, there is going to be much more pricing pressure on institutions, and we're going to have to come up with you know, a new system of pricing what we do. It's not just a new number, but it's a new mechanism for figuring this out that recognizes the difference um, and takes that into account. So it's already happening at Duke. Dr. Ghosh, what's, what's happening? So I, I think this is a bigger issue. And, uh, you know, first of all, uh, I agree with my co-panelists completely. I mean, if you remember when we started the pilot project with Coursera, 
last year. In our wisdom, we had decided to take a blended approach. And I said very clearly that we don't want to outsource our teaching learning process. And I think uh, that would take a, it's a completely uh, long debate, and, uh, but I think everybody realizes now uh, technology is a great enabler, but there are challenges if you just go for just digital learning. And we do not have all the answers. I'm just pointing that out. So it needs for that thinking definitely in this context. And uh, universities are also knowledge generators and research, say, for example, against COVID-19, would need labs, there's certain skills and hands-on training. You cannot substitute that. So we don't have all the answers. But I'm pointing to a, a bigger issue that the crisis shows us the importance of solidarity and collaboration. And I believe that universities should be the drivers of tomorrow's partnership ecosystem. You know, industry, academia, domestic, international, private, public, and universities should also be the quality controllers. I don't know who else would actually do the quality controller. So in this kind of very social, you know, uh, socialistic model, I don't know who would pay for this. So I think we need to rethink. I have some ideas, but that's for some other time. We, we used to think of this as tomorrow, but we have now suddenly arrived at this tomorrow today. So I think we need to think of if the, society, if the university is going to be the quality controller, university is going to do all this social work. Uh, and so how is it going to actually do the funding? Uh, because it's not going to be based on tuitions alone. It cannot be. And you know, so there will be other models that we need to think about for this new university, university of the future, which is today. Great, thank you. So let's switch now to questions from the audience. And we're gonna start with a practical question. It's from Pepe at IESC Business School. And this is from Matthew. And he asks, can you share an example of how you're actually using other people's courses in your own teaching? How does it work? How do you match the right course? How does the professor use the course? Can you, can you give us a little bit of a play-by-play? -play? Absolutely, and nice to hear from you, Pepe. Hope you're doing well. Um, what I would say is, I was involved in the design of a course at Duke Crenshaw that did exactly what I'm talking about. Um, we quickly built this course in partnership with a public health faculty member that was about the coronavirus and response. Um, it, was, it was called Global Pandemics, Global Epidemics in the Age of Interdependence. And you know, we were doing exactly what I said. We went hunting for high quality content so that we could launch this course in a matter of the weeks that we had. I thought I was gonna co-teach this class. A few other things happened in the meanwhile, so I wasn't able to do it, but we ended up kind of working with him. And what we found is a really good modular set of content from the University of Copenhagen, um, their School of Global Health. So we grabbed some modules from there. Duke had done an introduction to global health on Coursera. We grabbed some modules from our own Professor David Boyd. And so we, we, in figuring out how to kind of level up our students quickly and how to quickly launch a new high quality course, we did exactly this. The thing I would say is, in, you know, in Pepe's question, it was about teaching another person's course. And I think we need to move away from that language. Think modular content, course where, not course. Course sounds like, you know, I'm denigrating myself. I'm sublimating my own teaching to yours and I'm lower tier as a result. Instead, Curation is its own art. I'm grabbing content from here. I'm grabbing content from there. And we should reward that resourcefulness among faculty who are looking for high quality resources to bring to their students, not punish them in terms of, you know, that's lower prestige. That's not really the original design. I think that's that the new model of teaching and learning is going to reward that resourcefulness. And our focus is on how do we make sense of this? How do we piece it all together? How do we synthesize it? We have this information coming from here and this conflicting information coming from there. Our job is to put this all together into something that feels cohesive, that feels integrated. That's hard. That's a very different challenge. But, but I can say even already in the, you know, the past couple of months, we've already seen this progress. And I think there's more of this coming. We should f figure out how we're going to support our faculty in going through a process like that, in kind of overcoming some of the you know, issues we saw, the San Jose State Michael Sandel controversy early on in the kind of MOOC uh, movement. Let's move past that and figure out how to be smarter the second time around in thinking about courseware and supporting faculty with courseware. Great, thanks, Matthew. So the next question is from Reza Farivar, and it's a question for Dr. Butenteg. Um, from your experience, do you think we'll ever, ever see a full-fledged medical degree online? Um, 
I think we will. Um, of course, the practical still have to be done on lo in location and you can't teach everything fully online, but I think developments in simulation and augmented and virtual reality are going so quickly. And certainly the theoretical elements of the medical degree can be fully online. And at Imperial, we're actually moving quite a bit of the traditional teaching online in ways that excite students even more than the traditional way um, of, of actually giving the lectures and providing them with the information. So yes, I think certain elements still will have to take place locally also because it's important to get the local context for students. But I think most of what we teach in a medical degree can be put online in, in probably a relatively small number of years given the rapid developments. And some of it will even be better because some things in simulated surgery you can try to do as a medical student that you would never be allowed to do on real patients. And um, so, yeah, I, I think probably 80, 90 percent of the medical degree can be put online at some point in the future. We will come back in a few years and, and see if your prediction is correct. Thank you so yeah, much. I'm not sure exactly when, but I think it will happen. <laughs> I agree with you, actually. Um, so one final open-ended question to wrap us out. Um, if you had one piece of advice to give to other university leaders and professors who are on the call with us today, what would that piece of advice be? I think you need to tell us who should start. Um, Dr. Ghosh, you go first. Okay, so I think, um, you know, uh, I'm not very good at giving advice, uh, you know, we sort of lead by example. In this country, there is a reason why we have been one of the 10 private universities that have been chosen by the government as an institution of eminence that puts a lot of burden on us. I don't like to uh, talk about it much, but you know, we have a, the largest higher education system in this country, but we still had a huge problem of providing access, quality and affordability. This crisis has given us a push in the right direction. And so I, my, uh, my you know, suggestion would be that uh, take the plunge, but I think the quality part of it is the most important part. You know, providing access without quality or affordable education, but no quality is highly dangerous, is no good for anybody. So I think that uh, you know, this is really the right time to, to take the plunge, but ensure at all costs, quality of education. Great, thank you. Matthew. I and mean, speaking personally, it's incredibly challenging right now to try to seize the creative opportunities. We are so stressed as an institution. You know, my own family personally is stressed. I have family members who are sick with this disease and two kids at home without childcare. But I also think it's incumbent on us to figure out what that means and what it's going to be. And I see institutions, some of them are doing this, some of them are convening you know, recovery teams that are focused not just on the immediate crisis response, but also the what comes after. Duke has a task force on 2021 and another that's focused on 2030. Um, Stanford has this recovery team that's focused on the new normal. And I do think just to the extent that you can carve out a little bit of that space to preserve some of the creativity, it's very difficult, but I found it very rewarding. I published a piece in Inside Higher Ed uh, last week um, in the very little spare time that I had. And it, it kind of opened up a little bit of that space for me. And I think the same is true for many of our colleagues. So to the extent that you can, even under this extreme duress, I think it'll be good for your own well-being, for your own mental health, and also for your institution's long-term benefit. Great, thank you. And Simona? Yeah, I, I think I would say be empathic, be generous. Um, don't just focus indeed on your own institution and your own strength stress but think globally and let's realize we're in this together and if we stick together and if we think collaboratively we can actually create an opportunity for sustainable change in the right direction so i'm hoping that university leaders will start thinking more about working together across the globe and start focusing less on their own institutions and of course that's a challenge because the institutions clearly are stressed but I think people thrive when they feel that they can make a difference and that they can change other people's lives. And I think this is a great opportunity for universities globally to change the world. So think about why they're there and how to do that even better 
in the face of this crisis, I think is going to make us all come out stronger um, and um, yeah, make, create opportunities to truly change the world in the right direction. Great. Well, thank you to each of you and thank you so much for your leadership. And I think the, the message you're sending, Simona, is right on, at least for me and I think for a lot of the Corsarians, one thing that's happened out of this crisis is really brought together institutions across, across the world to collaborate and share knowledge. And so I hope we can continue this conversation. We're having regular webinars and regular discussions in our forum. And I think really we're only the, in the beginning stages of thinking together how we can collaborate and form the next phase of higher education. So thank you very much. And Betty, back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all of you, Simone and Matthew, Rupa Manjari and Leah. You've really given us a lot to think about.